female ambassador of Poland to Ireland. Since the embassy in Dublin was established exactly 30 years ago, so we are celebrating a very happy anniversary. I am I'm so inspired to see more and more women taking their rightful place in the workforce, in government, and their professional lives in general. I am also delighted to be an ambassador accredited to, to Ireland, the country which has so many women driving the policy. We have all done great work in the field of equality in the workplace so far, but there is still so much more that needs to be done. And we all have a part to play in instigating the change. I cannot fail to mention the similarities I see in the history of both Ireland and Poland when it comes to female emancipation. Poland and Ireland both regained independence in the turbulent times after the Great War. In 1918, both in Ireland and Poland, women won the right to vote. Both countries have great heritage of eminent women who left their mark in history of that period. In the early 1920s, Ireland saw Constance Markiewicz becoming the first female cabinet minister in Europe, by the way, wife of the Polish artist, another nice link between Poland and Ireland. And a few years later in Poland, fa world famous scientist and double prize, Nobel Prize winner Maria Skodowska Kiri was founding National Research Institute of Oncology, which is open to this day. Both our countries have strong Catholic roots and traditions, which Polish diaspora has successfully used to build bridges with local communities here in Ireland in the years after Poland's EU accession in 2004. In the 1990s, both Poland and Ireland went through serious economic changes. For Ireland, it was the Celtic Tiger. For Poland, it was when we became the first country in the world to abandon communism to create market economy. Having said that, three decades after the, those tra economic transformations started, we are still far away from equality in the workplace. Many women are occupying less important positions than men. The underrepresentation of women's voices in the leading positions means that the, their lives and experiences are not sufficiently reflected in policies and strategies. The low numbers of women in decision making also mean a waste of talent and resources. Imagine only around 32% leadership roles are taken by women in the European Union. When I look at those figures and trends, I strongly believe that those of us females who hold positions of leadership have the duty to do all we can to further empower young women. It is my hope that this webinar will contribute in any way possible to raising awareness and self-belief among women. Women in Poland, similarly to those in many other countries, have a special celebration on the 8th of March. This date might have different meanings in different countries or for different social groups, ranging from human rights activism to simple appreciation of women's participation in public or family life. Traditionally, in Poland, since the 1970s, the 8th of March was one of the most important dates in the calendar. The funny story from that period, and in, in fact, it could be also regarded as a sad story for those who remember the difficult time of socialism imposed on Poland, is that Polish ladies on that special day would receive a carnation and a voucher to purchase stockings which was a very valuable item back then. So in general, approach was quite conservative. However, 
with the demogra democratic transition, the approach has started changing gradually and the 8th of March has slowly become a date when not only men can express their gratitude to women, but also when women themselves publicly voice their concerns and address issues close to their hearts. I am very happy today to be joined by female leaders from the world of business, science and politics in both countries. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time out from what I am sure are busy schedules in order to participate in this webinar. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our six speakers who on the eve of the International Women's Day will discuss this important topic of women in leadership. I am listing the panelists in order of their appearance. From the Irish side, we are honored to have the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Hazel Chu, 352nd Lord Mayor of Dublin and the ninth woman to hold the office. Professor Yvonne Galligan, the Director of, for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in the Technological University Dublin. She's a political scientist specializing in gender and politics. Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, who is an advocate for pay, paving the way for women's rights in politics. From the Polish side, we welcome the following panelists. Wanda Buk, previously Deputy Minister in the Ministry of Digital Affairs and currently Vice President of the PGE Capital Group, which is Poland's largest energy sector company with respect to sales, revenues and net profit. Anna Schmidt, Secretary of State in the Ministry of Family and Social Policy, at the same time the plenipotentiary of the Prime Minister for for equal treatment. She has been voted the most influential female politician in southeastern Poland. Anita Kijanka, CEO of CAM Creations Group, communications hub specializing in new technologies. She is also the founder of Strong Women in IT Initiative. Both ministers, McKenzie and Schmidt, can't be with us in person. However, they did record a video speech for us that we will include in the webinar. Before I hand over to my colleague Piotr Ziembacz, our coordinator for the webinar, I want to say once more, welcome and thank you for your time. It is wonderful to have you here. I wish you all a very fruitful conference. Hello, Piotr. Thank, you, thank you very much, Ambassador. As, uh, as some of the speeches are pre-recorded, as uh, Ambassador mentioned, uh, we don't have QAS as an alternative. We invite you to our networking session after the webinar. Uh, we are live streaming, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining via YouTube. Uh, we will share the link uh, on the video from the webinar on the Embassy's uh, Facebook page uh, on Monday the 8th uh, of March to mark the International Women's Day. And it is a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, our first speaker. It's Lord Mayor of Dublin, Hazel Chu. Uh, I'm just sort of waiting for our technical team uh, to let me know when Lord Mayor is ready. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just uh, uh, I'll just uh, tell our 
viewers in Poland and in Ireland a bit more about uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, so Hazel Chu is the ninth uh, woman to hold the office of Lord Mayor of Dublin. She studied politics and history in UCD uh, and trained to be a barrister at King's Inn. She first uh, became involved in politics in 2014. In 2019, uh, she became the first Green Party councillor to be elected in the local elections for the ward of Pembroke when she topped the poll with impressive 4,000 first preference votes. Uh, in the same year, she was elected chair of the party and she very often lends her voice to promoting diversity and equality and is a regular media contributor. So and now I'll just uh, wait uh, on a word from uh, our technical team and hopefully we'll get uh, Lord Mayor Hazel Chiller. Okay, so uh, Kamil, could you just send me a message and let me know if uh, uh, Lord Mayor Hazel Chu is in the lobby? So, uh, so if uh, if uh, Lord Mayor Hazel Chu is not here yet, can, could I ask you to play a video uh, that Ambassador Anna Sohanska and uh, other ambassadors here in Dublin prepared for International Girls Day? International Girls Day is uh, is the uh, uh, same as the Women's Day. It's a really important holiday. And uh, to mark it on an annual basis, uh, we have a really good video with Ambassador Sohanska and all the female ambassadors uh, here in the diplomatic corps in Dublin. So, uh, Kamil, if you could uh, play that video. and I am the ambassador of Poland to Ireland. Together with my colleagues, the other female ambassadors posted in Ireland, we wish to convey a special message to you. Today, on 11th of October, we celebrate the International Day of the Girl. You may not have heard about it, but we believe it is very important to give this day the recognition it deserves. On this occasion, we address you, our younger colleagues, our younger sister. To tell you this from the bottom of our hearts, you are all unique and beautiful in your own way. And you must try to make the best out of what life has to offer. We, female ambassadors in Ireland, come from different parts of the world. From different backgrounds and have different life experiences. But what joins us together is the fact that we all came here to proudly represent our countries and their legacies. For many of us, the path that led to this moment was not always easy and posed its own problems. So we understand that being a young girl at the beginning of your own path can be challenging. Regardless of where you come from. And we also know that so much depends on you. So be brave. Demand and enjoy the rights set forth in the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. They are your rights. No one he has more power to change your life than you. We are all different, but we are all important in our own way. Don't try to pretend to be someone you're not. Always be yourself and accept yourself the way you are. You are the ultimate you, the ideal you, the perfect you. Don't be afraid and believe in yourself. Learn new things, go after your dreams. Even make mistakes, we all do. But once you do, try to learn from them. Do your best, be respectful towards others, but always demand respect on return. Don't forget, the world is in your hands. 
Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. My name is Riley and I am the ambassador of Finland. My name is Yoli Samaya and I'm the ambassador of South Africa to Ireland. My name is Sabina and I'm the Chargé d'Affaires of Canada in Ireland. My name is Daike Potzel and I'm the ambassador of Germany here in Ireland. My name is Manuela and I am the ambassador of Romania to Ireland. My name is Haris and I'm the ambassador of Cyprus. My name is Olena Sharaput and I am Chargé d'Affaires of Ukraine to Ireland. My name is Carla Serazzi and I'm the ambassador of Chile. My name is Katerina and I'm the ambassador of Greece. My name is Dr. Emenike and I am the ambassador of Nigeria to Ireland. My name is Gilan and I'm the ambassador of the state of Palestine to Ireland. My name is Eliana and I'm the ambassador of Brazil to Ireland. My name is Patricia and I am the ambassador of Colombia. My name is Gergana and I'm the ambassador of Bulgaria to Ireland. My name is Anna and I am the ambassador of Poland to Ireland. Madam Ambassador, Madam Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I really regret that I cannot join you in person, but urgent duties outside Warsaw forced the changes of plans. However, because I attach great importance to this event, I wanted to record my message to thank Madam Ambassador and Polish Embassy for this initiative and for organizing the Women in Leadership Conference. It is crucial to highlight and promote the role of women in politics and societies to empower women and girls so they believe in themselves and their abilities. I would also like to send my greetings to Madam Minister and Madam Lord Mayor of Dublin. Our examples show that women can reach for the highest positions. We prove as well that empowering women is not a national issue only, but one that crosses borders. Therefore, it is even more important that Irish and Polish women like us stand side by side to encourage young women to be bold, confident and unlimited in their choices. Women's full participation in socio-economic and political life is constrained by many factors, including higher levels on female poverty, greater participation in caring responsibilities and exclusionary institutional rules and procedures. Despite a long history of women's participation in public life and their ever-increasing involvement, women worldwide are still underrepresented in all aspects of decision-making. Polish women won their electoral rights as early as 1918 as one of the first in Europe. 100 years later, in the general elections in 2019, women accounted for 42.1% of the total number of candidates on election list to the lower chamber. Ultimately, the number of seats occupied by women accounts for over 28% of the total number of seats. In the higher chamber, almost one quarter of the seats in the Polish Senate are occupied by women. Women leadership is not needed in politics only. Women have a role to play also in economic life. Polish women are enterprising. Over one third of companies in our country are run by women. For years, the female entrepreneurship rate in Poland has been one of the highest in Europe and among OECD countries. According to the Eurostat data, the level of managerial positions in 2018 occupied by women in Poland was one of the highest among European Union countries. 43.2% compared to the average 34.2%. Fewer women are holding positions on managerial boards. However, in eight years between 2010 and 2018, we saw an increase of women on board of stock exchange companies, an increase from 11% to 23%. A comprehensive pro-family policy that enables parents to combine professional and family responsibilities is the key condition for women's high professional activity and their leadership functions. The Polish government attaches great importance to this, 
which is why expenditure related to family benefits has been gradually increasing for several years. Now, Poland is one of the European Union leaders when it comes to the involvement of GDP affected to these purposes. The work is not yet done, however. There is still much to be achieved in terms of the perception of female leadership. Fortunately, no one today questions the right of women to participate in politics and socio-economic life actively. Unfortunately, women's commitment and careers are still much more critically assessed than men's. Polish Nobel Prize winner in field of poetry, Wysława Szymborska, put it well when she wrote The man had views, the woman was still just a whim. The equivalent of his willpower was her womanly stubbornness and his prudence her calculation. And in situation where a man was called a tactician, the woman remained a schemer. In these troubled times of pandemic, we need even more female leaders who integrate the female perspective into national and global politics. I wish myself and all of us to find these female talents as soon as possible and include them in the mainstream of political and socio-economic decision-making. I wish you an interesting debate and I'm looking forward to the feedback of the conference. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, especially ladies. Um, I'm very happy that I can talk to you to, uh, talk to you right now, and I can share with you my perspective. Uh, maybe some of you find it inspiring, or if not, that's okay. That's only my perspective. You don't have to agree with that. Um, I must admit that I'm always a little bit, uh, a little bit afraid of um, of an event like this, and I will tell you why. When I was working at the Ministry of Digital Affairs as a Vice Minister, uh, I remember the situation. I will never forget the situation. I would like to share with you. Um, once uh, my um, a friend of mine, it's a journalist called me and join uh, and um, and uh, asked me to join the panel the expert panel he 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 was uh, he was organized and he he told me a little bit about this panel um, and then i said okay you know that's very nice a good idea to discuss those things but you know i think that my colleague from the ministry uh, another vice minister uh, would be would be more suitable for 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 this because actually this is the this is the, uh, the this is the area that he's covering you know and um, and you know i'm about i'm covering something completely different and then he answered me he told me you know vanda but actually i need a woman to the panel and i was like oh my god really so you don't care whether I'm a professional, whether I'm an expert about, uh, about this. You only care about my gender and because you need, you need a woman to the panel because it looks good right now. Um, you know, I will never forget that. Never before and never after I felt so irritating about uh, about um, my gender, ab about this whole gender issue that is that is around, I never felt some kind of humiliated as um, as in the in in this specific moment. And you know what? Um, I think that women today don't want this, and for sure we don't need this. So. I think that this is a very specific moment of the history that we should be really, really careful about because there is a moment, th this is the time when we can pass the Rubicon after uh, and behind which there is no longer fight for equal right, for equality, for fairness, for, uh, for fair treatment. But 
there is some kind of positive discrimination. So what I wanted to say uh, to tell you right now is that yeah, we should we should be very careful, and uh, we should we should be smart about about choosing our battle right now. Um, you know, supporting others. I'm sorry, I'm just doing like that all the time. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop. I can, I, I see it right now. Um, you know, supporting others is, of course, always a good idea. And it's always good. But, and especially when the others uh, are in a, some kind in a, in a worse situation. And you know what? I think that women generally are in a worse situation when it comes to their professional lives. And why is that? Because generally um, there is a there is there is a time in um, in a, uh, in, a, in our lives in the most of, most of most of uh, most of us when we are giving a birth to a child. Um, of course, those of uh, we not I, I'm not I'm not saying that everyone needs to of course, uh, for sure not. But most of us have this moment in our lives, and this is the very very difficult uh, situation for us because we don't. Th this is the time when we have to we have to some kind of reconcile. You know those uh, two very difficult areas of our lives. And this is the time when I think that women really need the support and are really in a worse situation than men. And, you know, that will never change. You know, we were in a worse situation, we are and we will be because this is this is how it this is how it is some sometimes there is well there is a time in our lives in a women's lives when our career slow down or uh, or even stop sometimes for good because we are deciding to uh, to devote our our lives for for our children and i think that what we should focus about right now is to create mechanisms is to create to create regulation which would help us to come back to work. And I think that we should say it out loud that we are in a worse in a in a worse situation, and we need preferences. But somehow we are a little bit afraid of that. We are a little bit afraid of saying that we need preferences. The question is why is that? Why we are so afraid of admitting that we need help, that we need help because we have, we are in a different situation. Um, I observe something like that. I observe women, women with, who don't want to admit that this is very, that they are going through a very challenging time, that they cannot reconcile their, you know, uh, their career. They are uh, with being uh, with being a mother. You know, it's it's uh, it's very difficult. I can observe it right now when I watch uh, when I watch my when I observe it my friends. But um, you know, actually, this is I think I personally think, but that this is right now the only aspect of our life of our professional predisposition which differs us from men. And there is no other differences, I think. No, and I think that no other fears, no other prejudice should prevent us from trying to reach our goals. And, you know, I've been working in a quite demanding environment for almost a decade. I observe women and men on their professional fields every day. And you know what I think about women? I think that if they only want to, and if only are a little bit of lucky, exactly like men, they are educated and they are competent. If they only want to, and only are a little bit lucky, just like men, they go to the industries that they are dream of. As long as they have predisposition, determination, and are a bit lucky, just like the men, 
they reach their heights. And actually, I would never confirm stereotypes that, for example, women are more emotionally involved, sen uh, sensitive, you know, all the stuff, we know that, they, 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 that this stuff exists, those, those, those kinds of stereotypes. Um, it's not good, but, you know, I'm not sure whether we should really focus on fighting with, with those. Perception is not the reality. Personally, I prefer to focus on doing my job as best I can because I care about my job and not because I want to prove something that someone. And also, I do not agree with, you know, creating uh, an ideology that we need woman leadership, female point of view. I think that we need a good leadership. We need reasonable point of view. And if we really want to contribute as a woman, I think we should provide good leadership, not female leader, uh, leadership, good leadership. This is what we should what we should focus about. Um, focus on. Sorry, um, when there is unequal treatment, injustice on every uh, any area, discrimination, no matter for what reasons. I don't think we should fight with them only on behalf of women. These phenomena actually are not only about gender, and we know we we all know about it, and we should generally fight with them because, you know, injustice, unequal treatment is just bad. So as I told you already, we should be smart about choosing our battles. And my battle, my personal battle, is to find, uh, is to find against discrimination, against uh, injustice and unequal treatment, no, no matter who is affected, whether it is a man, woman, person of color, no matter what. Um, my battle is to support women in making it easier to return to work after childbirth, after to maintain the level of competences after a maternity leave, to reconcile the role of a parent and employee, because I think that there is a lot, a lot need to be done on this area. And my battle is not to creating a sense of the existence of two different worlds when it comes to competences and predispositions. You know, words of a man and of a woman, a kind of woman leadership, woman point of view, female point of view. Well, I, I cannot tell you that I observed on, in my professional career that there is something specific in female point of view. There's nothing specific. There's nothing specific. If you know women are competent and you know is intelligent, well, she has an interesting point of view. If she is not, well, like the same as a man. So I don't think that there are two different words that we should that we should make equal, of course, when it comes to competences and predisposition, because I told you that there is some kind that need to be done when it comes to the, you know, like our natural um, predisposition to giving a child to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, to give a birth to a child. Um, I think there are no different worlds. Uh, professional, professionally, there is one world of people who are men, women, people of color, or or not people of color, uh, people competent and incompetent. And you know what? I just want to tell you that I don't want to contribute to the situation uh, as I as I experienced. So the one that I was invited to the panel only because I was a woman. Not because I was a woman who is competent, because I was not on this area, uh, but because I was a woman. Even though I was working so hard days and nights, you know, to become as professional as I only could be in the past, I was acknowledged only because I was a woman. 
I don't want to contribute to that. And I would like to leave you with this to maybe it will be inspire, inspiring for, for, for some of you. Maybe it will be not. This is my perspective. You don't have to agree with that. And also, I know that what I share with you is based on my personal experience. So uh, I would love to hear your opinions, your experience, and maybe uh, I, for sure that will be inspiring, inspiring to, to me. Um, yeah, I think I over the time right now. So no, no, you know, it, it, it is. It was perfect, just on time. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you very, thank you very much for this ins really inspirational presentation. I think it was really insightful and extremely clear. So again, and thank you very much. So uh, I know that uh, you have a really tight schedule as well, and uh, myself, ambassador, and all, and our team here in the embassy, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. On screen now. Lord Mayor, it's great to see you. Hi, Peter. It's lovely to see you. Uh, folks, we had a technical difficulty with, with, with joining earlier on, and I'm very, very, very sorry to, to start the speech by saying this, but it will literally be 60 seconds because I have a call that I cannot push out. That is fine. To. So um, just very quickly, thank you to the embassy and thank you to the ambassador and the team for having me. And um, I, I now have to condense a 10 minute speech into one minute. So just the main points to say, listen, it, it, it's hard no matter what role in leadership you're in, but in, terms of female leadership we we have we've been progressing we've definitely been changing the dial but we haven't progressed to where we want to be and that it involves everyone having to push more and the reason why I say we haven't progressed to where we want to be is because you can see it that in in uh, industry in the corporate sector non uh, nonprofits every industry where currently <clears throat> the gender pay gap is 14.4%. So uh, if you look at how many women are on the table when it comes to boards, the uh, it's completely disproportionate um, uh, way towards um, male versus uh, female. If you look at our political sphere, we're 22% uh, on in Ireland alone, we're 22% on a council level uh, that are female, 21% in the Dáil and 30% in the Shannon. And in a population where it's it's close to 50-50, that isn't in good enough at all. And this is why women in leadership, it, 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 it's, it's a rare thing and it shouldn't be. And it should be something that we should be advocating for. And the women that are in power, that are in leadership, should be pushing for. So uh, on my part, I, I would love to talk more about it. I'm very sorry I don't have time, but I would love to come back and talk to yourselves. But I also would uh, say if you have any uh, questions, email me about it, lordmayor at dublincity.ie. And one thing I would say is that uh, the challenge right now is to change not just the conversation we talk about we talk to the cows come home about women uh, being in leadership about the stresses and the need for them to be at the table but we also don't have the action on how to get them on the table we need to challenge unconscious bias when it comes to recruitment process and that's something that I would be writing to uh, Minister McEntee and also Minister Gorman after we have a working session next Tuesday from this office on, on the topic we need to challenge what are the barriers Barriers keeping women from uh, getting to the table. So, very simply, is it family? Is it the fact that we need more public uh, childcare? Is it the fact that there is a, a lack of mentorship from an early level, from school to to university to then work level? Is it uh, simply that people cannot afford it because people can't uh, sometimes afford the continue uh, the uh, professional development to get them there as well? How do we bridge those gaps? And that's what we need to start looking at. And that's what we need to uh, start making sure we have reform in place and policies in places to change. Again, I'm very, very, very sorry. And um, I look forward to speaking you, to you all again. So apologies for, for the shortness. Thank you so much. I think I think that it was really well condensed. Uh, and, uh, and I think we've got everything through that we wanted to do. So
Thank you very much again, Lord Mayor. Uh, and uh, everything that Lord Mayor said uh, uh, about the number of women in in Senate and uh, number uh, of women in Parliament, I think it's a really nice segue into our next presentation, our next uh, panelist, uh, Professor Yvonne Galligan uh, from uh, uh, Technological University Dublin, uh, who I think uh, who who I think will uh, really nicely pick up where Lord Mayor left. Hello, Professor Galligan. How are you today? Hello, Peter. How are you? Hello, everybody. And uh, good morning, uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Sochanska, and uh, distinguished speakers and friends. It's great to be with you all. I'm going to do my very best to uh, share my screen uh, with you because I have some slides. So excuse me while I, while I try and uh, get that organized. Um, let me see. Fingers crossed. I have it. Uh, uh, oh, uh, so it says not now. Oh, so I'm finding it difficult to share my screen. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, uh, so maybe uh, someone from the uh, technical unit can uh, can actually share it with me, please, because I think I sent it on earlier. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, and um, Professor Galligan, is it the presentation or is it the video? Uh, no, the presentation, please. The presentation. Uh, I, I think uh, last time we tried, I think we managed to, uh, to share it from your uh, device, was it? Yeah, we did. We did. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, this time I, I'll try again. I, 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 so okay. I press share screen, but maybe I'm doing something wrong uh, at my end because I have the presentation open, uh, okay. but it doesn't seem to want to uh, share for some reason. All right. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, so I'm just uh, I'm just checking with Kamal, who's uh, who, uh, who's going to join us here, and uh, he's going to lend us a hand. Hello, everybody. Let me just try to help. Oh, coming. Uh, Professor uh, Ivan Galligan with this issue uh, really quick. So, uh, Professor Galligan, uh, you are using Google Chrome, obviously, yes? Yes, I'm using Google. Oh. Uh, well, yes, I'm using Google Chrome on this. Yes, I am. But um, um... I understand. So, Professor Galligan, uh, when you are uh, pressing the share button, do you see yes. a window that is popping up for you? Uh, I. It disappears. It keeps disappearing. Professor on... Galligan. Yes, I'm here, and but uh, that <laughs> screen keeps disappearing on me. Uh, uh, because I couldn't hear you, there were some difficulties. Oh, uh, sorry. screen freezed for me, uh, so I couldn't hear you. If you can repeat what happened. Uh, so, what's happening is that my screen, uh, the, the, when I press share, the the little screen, it just pops up for a second and then disappears. I see. You know, I <clears throat> if you have time for it, I think you should refresh the uh, browser. Clear the cookies, refresh the browser, and join one more time. Uh, <laughs> or in case of bigger oh, okay, but, but that sounds really complicated even for me. Yeah. I, uh, so, so maybe so, Professor Galligan, can, uh, do you think you'll be able to talk around the numbers? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I can. Um, I, I can talk around that. I, I that's the easiest thing to do. So, uh, apologies, uh, colleague. No, no problem. For, we have, we do apologize. Sorry for all of this. Uh, it's. <clears throat> So, um, so, uh, so what I want to do today is to bring an academic point of view to some uh, thoughts on uh, women's uh, leadership in Ireland and Poland. 
And um, and I would like to maybe begin by some uh, reflection on some of uh, the the position of where we are. We have had uh, some indication of this from our last speaker, Lord Mayor Hazel Chu, and also from uh, Minister Anna Schmidt, who have both mentioned statistics and uh, around women's leadership in uh, Ireland and Poland, respectively. Um, and uh, they have been very interesting. And so I will just kind of expand a little bit uh, on that. Um, so both of them have, say, have pointed out that uh, both Ireland and Poland have quite some way to go before women and men are equal uh, in in many as in all aspects of life in uh, politics in the corporate world and in uh, economic and social life more generally and we find this is the case of the as they have both described in politics um, in the corporate world women and men are not equal uh, in Poland and Ireland, and also in another important sphere of decision making and leadership in the judiciary. So across the European Union, uh, women's uh, share of positions in Supreme Courts is 40%. In both Ireland and uh, Poland, women's share of Supreme Court positions is 25%, even though the um, legal profession, which is the pipeline into judiciary, is, uh, is very much dominated uh, by women in both countries. Um, however, what we do find is that in both countries, women are more likely to have a third level education than their male peers are. So in Ireland, 60% of women between the ages of 25 and 34 years have completed their third level education, compared to half of men in this age group. In Poland, women account for over 70% of all students on postgraduate degrees in 2019 and 20, uh, so just very recently. So women are finding the um, uh, equipping themselves with very significant levels of education in order to be able to contribute to the workforce and to society more generally. However, there are some areas where Ireland and Poland do better than the EU average. And one of these is in the area of media regulating bodies. There are equal numbers of women and men on media regulation boards in Ireland. And in Poland, this membership is gender balanced, 40% female, 60% men. And across the EU, this is not the case. The EU uh, level on average is about one third female membership of these boards. And here I think education makes, is where education comes through. So in terms of uh, Ireland and Poland with women's higher levels of education and skills, uh, higher level of, um, of expertise, this knowledge finds itself, finds a home for itself in the areas of regulation. That legal knowledge, the business knowledge, the cultural knowledge, all comes together in this space and in other areas of, uh, of regulatory bodies. So looking a little bit more closely at this issue of uh, gender inequality and trying to make some kind of sense of it, um, it's something that doesn't happen by accident. It is something that our societies organize and many gender scholars call this organization of inequalities between women and men. They call it a gender regime that a society has. One very distinguished um, political theorist, her name is Carol Pateman. She describes this organized inequality as a product of a contract between society 
women and the state. She calls this a sexual contract. And she wrote uh, a book entitled The Sexual Contract 30 years ago that still is relevant today. For Carol Pakeman, the sexual contract is based on women's subordinate status. And this carries into law, into policy, into practices, and it also carries into social attitudes. So Carol Pakeman's contribution to our thinking around um, how, how do we make sense of gender inequality is a very useful concept. This notion of uh, the sexual contract is very useful when we're trying to understand the persistence of gender equality in leadership. Um, and it leads to us also, and it leads to us uh, identifying stereotypes in society. Now, of course, as Van der Boek says, we don't want for there to be stereotypes and we don't want women or indeed men to be stereotyped into very limited roles. But nonetheless, there are these quick measures and quick ways of thinking that develop into uh, stereotypes and images of women's roles in society that are based on this inequality and this lesser status of women towards me to men in society. And these leads to many assumptions about what are women's roles and what are men's roles. In Poland, and this comes out in terms of time and how people spend their time. In Poland, for example, more than 80% of women spend time do, doing housework and cooking each day. And about half of Polish women spend time caring for other family members each day. One third of Polish men spend time cooking and cleaning and one quarter spend time doing family care work each day. In Ireland, we see similar patterns. Nine in 10 women spend time on housework and cooking, and, and cooking each day, while almost half of men do so. And in Ireland, just under half of women spend time doing care work each day, while about 30% of men do this each day. So you can see that just in terms of how time is organized, women carry a much greater share of the caring uh, and nurturing uh, activities required in families and in societies than do men. And yet in both countries, over 60% of women aged 15 to 64 are in employment. So our societies expect women to carry a double burden of work to a much greater extent than we expect men to. We certainly don't expect that there is a sharing, an equal sharing of all of this work. And might I say that this data drawn from the European Institute for Gender Equality uh, Index for 2020 um, is data that predates the COVID period. So it will be very interesting to see what that data shows um, when it comes to assessing our COVID times. And now let us look to COVID because this is the background environment in which all of us are living our lives at the moment. Last year, we have seen, in the last year, we have seen many issues with regard to women and family life come to the fore. Because women's jobs are often part-time, COVID has increased the insecurity of their employment. The jobs hardest hit in the pandemic uh, these jobs in the hospitality sector, in personal services and in retail are the sectors that are heavily reliant on women's work.
our frontline staff in healthcare, our cashiers in shops are predominantly women. And COVID has brought a focus on the incidence of domestic and gender-based violence to the fore. Services to vulnerable women and children are stretched to meet demand. Combining work and homeschooling is a daily challenge through this COVID period. And in Ireland in particular, the absence of organised childcare for frontline workers has been an immense challenge to overcome. These issues and more need women's leadership. They are highlighted by women who are speaking up for women and challenging the sexual contract in their spheres of influence. So, for example, the European Parliament has recently passed a very comprehensive report and resolution on gender equality in and after COVID times. It's well worth looking at. It was written and it was steered by a Dublin uh, member of the European Parliament, Frances Fitzgerald. In society, women have come together to speak out and lead the debate on gender equality during and after COVID. Their leadership and that of many women taking action in their communities, in public life and the corporate world are making a difference. So it's clear that we need more women in, uh, in leadership roles because having more women there brings their talents, energy and perspective to leadership. And that makes a difference to the quality of the leadership in, uh, and the outcomes in our societies. It brings diverse points of view to the fore because I have to slightly beg to slightly differ with one of our earlier speakers and say that because women are socialized differently, because women experience the world differently to men, then women do bring a different way of understanding the world and understanding problems in the world to the fore. And when they bring this into leadership, it enables decisions that are more inclusive, that respond, decisions that respond to all citizens' needs, rather than responding to the needs of uh, specific and individual groups. So having more women in leadership means a more holistic leadership in all the different spheres of our society. Women leaders at this event, all of us here, by being in the positions that we hold and that our speakers hold, we are challenging the stereotypes around society's expectations of women's roles. And other adults, along with boys and girls, learn from our distinguished women speakers and from our contributions that leadership is something that women do and do well. So in conclusion, let us not lose our, our voices as we move into the post-crisis time. In our own spheres of influence, we need not accept the old sexual contract. Instead, my suggestion is that we challenge the stereotypes, that we be role models of and for all women and girls. And that together, using our leadership, we can make a better new normal for women and men, boys and girls in Poland and in Ireland. And so I hope that we can go forward at, in this International Women's Day event to consider these issues. So, Peter, I'll hand back over to you now. 
Uh, so uh, we have uh, two more speakers. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really delighted to invite our next speaker. It is Anita Kianka. Uh, she's CEO of Concreations Group. And she will speak on a very timely and important topic, uh, women in IT. Yes, hello. Hello, hello Peter. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. Um, okay, let's try how to share my screen because I have a special presentation for you. Um, okay, let's check. This now at the moment, I hope yes. Um, okay. Yes, I see that you can see it, perfect. So let's put the full screen and I will start my presentation. So um, Strong Women in IT is an initiative that I started two years ago and um, it is um, uh, so um, and this is an initiative that's goal, uh, that its goal is to present and show uh, women that lead tech companies. Because usually when you think about women, there's lots of hundreds or even thousands of um, projects that invite women to join tech. But do you uh, have you ever thought who those women are who, who are leading the, the tech companies? This is something that was truly concerned me and I was truly interested how who they are who they really are, what do they like, what do they dislike about working in IT business. And this is how this project, this Strong Women in IT started. And I, today I will present you the best, the most interesting outcomes from this uh, um, report. Um, and this report was published uh, two years ago. This year we are going to publish uh, the newest edition, so please uh, Mm, look and follow our initiative on LinkedIn and where you will uh, be informed about uh, the next project. Last year, uh, we uh, it was exactly the end of November 2020, we published the different reports, Strong Leaders Creator, where we wanted to see what exactly companies are doing to promote women in tech, what they are doing at this stage of recruitment, uh, when women um, simply grow and how they help them educate or simply what do they do when we decide to simply have a family, babies and how they help or whether they help them uh, in this important stage of life. But coming back um, to our report, uh, today, I would like you to, to present who are these women in Poland? What do they like and dislike in tech industries? And what do they see as success and failures? Because um, sometimes when you think about being a leader, there's lots of discussion about loneliness, about being uh, on your own with decisions, problems, and all the stuff connected with running a business. Um, so here is something that I, I hope that you will like and uh, you can relate on. Um, but from the beginning, how did, you, how did we do this report? Um, answer to these questions were um, given by 117 women that are running IT companies all over the world. But uh, the point is that this should be, uh, this should, be should be women from Poland. Because uh, we simply started to narrow it down and have this point of view from the Polish perspective. And these were mainly owners, founders, uh, there were women at C-level position, and also there were directors and managers, and probably the lowest position was head. But this is also important position. Uh, so almost 120 women answered to our question, our question. So when you think about femininity in business in one word, do you have one? Do you, there is one that comes to your mind when you think about hmm, what the word can describe as femininity, can describe as feminine in business. In our opinion, after reading this report and all the answers that were given, we may say that this is empathy. So uh, in two words, uh, if you could think about two words that describe women in business in IT, what would it be? Tech, math, uh, algorithm, software, really, it is empathy and intuition. Because we asked uh, those women, what are the features that help them grow business? 
What are the key factors that help them grow, uh, understand project, clients, teams? They were now not you know, exactly hard skills. They were exactly those soft skills that they presented, pointed, showed as crucial when it comes to running a business in IT. And this is really interesting when you think about starting a business in IT and you didn't graduate from a tech university. Because uh, um, each day I'm running a peer agency that communicates the companies. I have PhDs in social science, but the point is not to know exactly um, how these products are created. You have to understand how they are working, what they are doing. And this is exactly what, when you are a leader, you have to do. You don't have to go into details, details so deeply that you can almost um, program uh, different softwares. You have to simply um, connect the dots. As you, mean, as you can see on this presentation, I have lots of dots. You have to connect the dots. But there are uh, three successes uh, that those women mentioned as the biggest in 2018. I am really interested in what they will answer this, this year. And one of them, uh, and there is one important um, issue here, we decided to divide uh, women represent startups and women represent corporations because there are different uh, like areas and different situations when you think about business. Having um, a company that is at the beginning of um, typing something new and working in a corporation, you have completely, maybe completely, maybe not exactly, but uh, you have different uh, environment when you work. So coming back to this presentation and this slide, when you think about startup and corporation, they are quite the same. So those women mentioned that product development, creating a something, something new, um, are making some um, already existing softwares better. They are the, their biggest successes. Think about you. What's your, what's your biggest success from 2020? Uh, what you are really proud of? And here I will show you some quotes from our um, women in, uh, in strong, strong women in IT that maybe you will also rely on and resonate. Understanding that developing the perfect product is not a synonymous, synonymous with doing a lucrative business. Change the approach to company development. The second success that, they, that was mentioned was team management. Probably if you are running a company or an um, association or different organization, you know how sometimes it is difficult to find the right team at the right position. So having a great team, this is something we truly say as, as our success. And here is, I think, quite interesting, but for someone maybe obvious, finances was uh, almost one third um, um, area of success for startups and promotion of what, what someone is doing was 11, has um, 11, answer, uh, 11 answers. Making our brand recognizable in Poland over there and winning over 50 paying customers. So um, lots of companies mentioned that um, being a recognizable, let, let them simply find more clients. Failures. In Poland, this is not so um, like open area. We are afraid of failures. We sometimes ashamed of them and say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't mention it. Maybe I shouldn't talk about them. Because uh, if I will say that I, they're, they are failures, I'm not so good at that. If you are smart enough, you can learn from them. So here are the three failures that women from startups and corporation mentioned as the biggest in 2018. I'm really interested how they will be, uh, how, what, what this year will bring us. Product development was the biggest failure for startups uh, in 2018, and almost one third fail here. And what is interesting, overwork was something that was mentioned by more than one third of women for corporations. Um, probably COVID, pandemic, and all this remote work um, may, may cause that this will be um, even higher this year, but we will see. Team management. As I mentioned, running a business, uh, you cannot work alone. Success is a matter of who we uh, who you are surrounded with. And here is not always um, easy task as we see. 
too long delay with the decision to end a corporation with one of the employees disregarding your intuition. Uh, one of the biggest roles uh, of strong women in my team is not only to publish this type of reports. Um, our goal is to simply integrate, talk together, and share our thoughts, feelings, beliefs, doubts, um, worries. Um, we organize, uh, every two weeks, we organize different webinars where we talk with women uh, who are sharing their experience. And what is really good, I think, is that we can simply saw that there is not something that the grass is greener in the neighbors, uh, on the neighbor's side. Sometimes we have exactly the same problems, uh, but we simply, we are too focused on it and, too, and forget that this is not, we are not alone here. So the last failure was in, in startup case were finances. Um, obviously, when you start the project, you have to remember that um, you have to find clients, you have to find investors, and be ready to manage it. Uh, in case of corporation, it was product development, where sometimes um, it is not so easy when the situation is changing so fast. Hiring the wrong people and giving them too much trust caused financial problems. This is also one of the uh, one of the quotes that one of our a strong women in my team mentioned. I wonder who, which of you had exactly the same problem. So, um, and this was, uh, this is an area that I was really fond of, because um, why do you like IT? Uh, why do you like working in this industry? What are the pros and cons of being part of it? And absolutely, I am exactly representing the same approaches. Um, please find, think, what is in your case? So. Three reasons why women in tech likes being an, in IT is dynamic development of the industry, dynamic changes, and the possibility to create the future. So as you see, when you think about this woman, this typical woman that works in IT, she must be dynamic. Otherwise, she won't be happy to be to live and to create such innovation, innovative product. And she must to change something, want to be disruptive and who wanted to have some influence on how on the, or the way we live. If you think about nowadays, digital transformation is absolutely taking us over. Uh, this, uh, without technology, this event wouldn't have place. So um, as you see, this technology is shaping the way we communicate and even share our knowledge. So what are the dislikes? What are the things that make this um, industry difficult to work in? And here we decided to divide it once again into startup and corporation. And as you see, these pros are also the discounts of working in this industry. Dynamic changes, dynamic development of the industry, and here's men domination and technology is aging. Um, and this is sometimes really important and not get missed when it comes to um, talk about talk uh, and discussion about technology. Because technology is aging, and when you are not dynamic enough, um, and you are working on a technology that in two years may be disrupted or taken by a giant that you know, uh, like um, for example, Snapchat and Instagram, you can simply be uh, really. In the problem in the trouble when it comes to running a business and as you see um, women mentioned also that this is a men dominated um, industry but I think that uh, sometimes it can be really motivated uh, motivated uh, motivative to simply show that we are uh, good enough and skilled enough to be in this industry uh, three common mistakes so we we have failures we have success we have likes and dislikes so mistakes, what do they see as mistakes that they, they can in 2018? Management, hmm. so it was running a company with not the right people uh, at the right position. It was product development. Um, of this thing, too many, taking too many projects results in problems in at least one of them. You have to measure your strength for intention. Being too ambitious or wanting to um, to, 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 many, to do too many projects at the same, at the one time, often uh, causes man, as many problems. 
if you are working in um, in a situation when the environment is not stable, you have to take more. Yeah, and this is on one hand this is obvious, but on the other hand it is so difficult. And um, and this is great that we can share in our strong community community uh, all our doubts and and think how we can measure and how we can grow together uh, with sharing such a problems. And this is a really interesting, and I think it may be um, surprising. Not listening to intuition was mentioned by uh, one of them, uh, women from startups, and lack of self-confidence, lack of uh, showing and presenting, promoting the um, outcomes, results of the work. So this is something that I hope that we will still try to um, change and be more self-confident, more more oriented of, on showing who we really are and what we can do. Um, I listen to my intuition and I am more sensitive to it. Some things do, do not have to be rationally justified, especially we women have this intuition deeply embedded. It's a huge, often unstoppable force. So that's all. Uh, this is uh, exactly what I to show you. And I hope... Um, that I hope that you'll like it. Uh, if you are interested in our initiative, I can make type here on our website. Um, I hope that I wasn't too hurry, but if you have some questions, I can, you know, um, you know, say say more words about uh, this uh, um, this questionnaire and this outcomes from this report. Uh, thank you, and I, I think this was really interesting. Uh, I really do appreciate it. and I have to say we're really honored uh, and having you here presenting uh, the idea of strong women in IT. So I personally, I found it, I found it uh, really, really useful. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It is not easy because when you think about um, being a um, leadership, running a company, you are so, usually you are so busy. Uh, and I am so grateful that so many wonderful women, uh, so hardworking and talented, decided to join and share their experience. Because, uh, as I mentioned, there is lots of initiative that promotes women in tech. Um, but we simply still don't know who they really are. Uh, what are the, um, like the uh, black, black uh, you know, this uh, pros and cons of being in IT business. So I hope that this report is like shed some light on, on what we are doing and who they, who they are. And um, someone maybe can relate and think, hmm, maybe this is still for me because I don't have to um, graduate from tech university. I can achieve success being after biology, geography or political science. Yes, I, th I think this is I think this is really, really inspiring. Uh, because uh, beca because of the pandemic, the lockdown, uh, many people were forced to change their careers. So so uh, so just uh, you proving to us that in order to start a kind of career in IT, it didn't have to be your first education. That uh, you still you, you still can go that go out there, you can start your own business and be a success in the IT. Yes, exactly. Because when you think about different solutions, um, they are different. They are need. They are you need uh, their different skills, uh, different knowledge. Think about biology. There is lots of med tech companies that are now is uh, really having a great time. When you think about re even the remote um, con medicine control, um, if you think about uh, geography and all these maps, virtual maps that we are having, fashion and tech business. Uh, so um, I think you can have a great achieve a great success in business in IT business only when you have some idea um, about your how you would like to grow your company uh, and find the right people that will like digitalize your ideas, uh, which is not so difficult nowadays. Yeah, I think I think digital is the buzzword for twenty first century, uh, and. Uh, like yeah we're in digital right now so i really thank you for kind of uh, giving us uh, a bit more details of where women are at with you know science technology engineering mathematics so it's a, it's really it's really it's really good to know that uh, it's never too late to change your career and uh, and i i think i think 
that uh, in the coming months we will see more and more people, both women and men, uh, just taking the, taking the leap and uh, many of them going into IT and technology, uh, which is at the moment booming. Yes, exactly. And what is what's my biggest dream is to simply have more women CEO uh, managers and directors, because this causes that the technology will be uh, equally created, uh, equally uh, presented for both uh, uh, genders. So I uh, and I think that this is really cool because when I think about my, my clients, um, unfortunately, 80 percent of them are men. So I hope that this uh, in future I will have more clients that will be well run that the company will be run by women and I can be truly really proud of being part of you know this uh, movement connected with empowering women. Exactly, and uh, yeah, this is this is like this really nicely ties us into uh, the stats that Professor Galligan shared shared with us. So. So we know when it comes to women in business who are chair people, uh, we're just not not very yet. Uh, and it's the same for Poland, for Ireland, and for European Union. Uh, so so it's really good to know where we're at and how, how much more we have to go. Yes, yes, absolutely. Totally agree. So um, thank you for, for the inv invitation and thank you for letting me show the outcomes, the more important outcomes, in my opinion, from this report. And please keep your finger crossed for the next edition, the edition 2021. Okay, yeah, I, I, think, I think everyone is looking forward to anything 2000, 2021. I want to forget about 2020. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking forward uh, to your research. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. I want to start by thanking you for the invitation to speak at your International Women's Day event. Since 2004, we have been welcoming Polish citizens who have chosen to come and live and work in Ireland. And we are immensely proud that so many of our fellow EU citizens have chosen Ireland as their home and we are truly grateful for the enormous contribution that they make to Irish society. Of course, there is a deep and long-standing connection between our two countries. Indeed, the history of that close connection can be traced as far back as the foundation of the Irish state. One of the most celebrated female figures from Ireland's history, Countess Markiewicz, was married to Kasimir Markiewicz, a Polish man. Countess Markiewicz was the first woman to be elected to the Westminster Parliament and to Dáil Éireann, but she was also the first female minister in a modern democracy, serving as our Minister for Labour between 1919 and 1922. Indeed, her life is a wonderful reminder of the progress many inspirational women have made throughout history and of the long-standing bond between our two countries. That bond has endured and it has strengthened over time. As I've mentioned, we are very grateful to the contribution that our Polish colleagues make in every walk of life in Ireland. And in my department in justice, we're very fortunate to have a number of skilled and dedicated Polish colleagues working in a variety of areas. This includes our frontline jobs in Angarda Siakana, the Border Management Unit, and in the Irish Prison Service. If I could, I just want to take this opportunity to personally thank them for their dedication and their commitment, particularly during the past year when our frontline services have faced immense challenges. The persistence, the drive, the willingness of all of our frontline staff to go above and beyond the call of duty, to overcome the many challenges the pandemic has presented, it's very much appreciated. So many of those working in the frontline across the justice sector are women, and we are making great strides in improving gender equality across our sector. I also think I'm very fortunate to be Minister for Justice at a time when so many capable women hold senior leadership positions in my department. And last year I was delighted to announce the appointment of Una McPhillips as the department's Secretary General. I have to say I was particularly struck by Una's words on her appointment when she said she could remember many capable female colleagues who in different times, with different opportunities, would have progressed to the highest level long before her. Thankfully times are changing. And we can see this across the entire European Union. In Ursula von der Leyen, we have our first woman president of the European Commission. Christine Lagarde is our first woman president of the European Central Bank. 
and I was especially thrilled to see Mairead McGuinness, my political colleague, but also my neighbour and friend, appointed as the first woman European Commissioner for Financial Services last year. And while all these appointments are welcome, we must look forward to a future when we no longer welcome high-profile firsts, women taking prestigious posts for the first time. Such appointments must be the norm and not something that we find remarkable. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet and we haven't reached that point. Here in Ireland, despite the introduction of gender quotas, we're still below the international average for the number of female members of Parliament. Only 23% of TDs in the current doll are women. There are four of us holding full Cabinet positions, but that's out of a total of 15 Cabinet Ministers. There are still too many barriers to women entering politics. I know so many women who are interested, involved in politics, but may not have the confidence. They don't have the confidence in themselves to actually run for public office. I think all of us in political life so may know so many brilliant women who work behind the scenes in party structures or in constituency organisations or who campaign on issues that they firmly believe in. So we need to do everything to remove more of the barriers presenting and preventing these women from taking the next steps, putting their own names on the ballot paper. That means making a political life more family friendly. It means more women leading by example. And having women presidents in Ireland when I was growing up as a girl and then as a young woman, this was hugely inspiring to me. In particular, Mary McAleese, her 14 years as president, this spanned across the years when I developed a real interest in politics. I was 11 when Mary was elected in 97. By the time she had left office in 2011, I was 25. I was working actively in politics and assistant to my father. Of course, I come from a political family and and I learned so much from my dad, but to have a woman serving with distinction in such an important position in Irish public life during the formative years of my life, it really left a huge impression on me. When girls see other women in strong roles, it gives them encouragement that they too can succeed. And just as girls of my generation looked to women such as Mary McAleese and others for inspiration and guidance, Those of us in politics now have a responsibility to make it easier for the girls coming behind us to fulfil their dreams and their ambitions. We need to show them that it can be done. And this International Women's Day, we are asked to choose to challenge. I will use my position and my time in office to answer that call, to drive changes, to ensure politics is a more welcoming place for women. I'm absolutely honoured to serve as Minister for Justice and I'm conscious that I'm in a department that can do so much to help women in very difficult circumstances, those who need our help. It is a sad truth that the majority of victims of domestic, sexual and gender-based violence are women. We must listen to their experiences, we must learn how their suffering can help us improve our laws and our criminal justice system. Tackling domestic, sexual and gender-based violence is one of my priorities and I'm introducing reforms to put the interests of the victim first. Last month, I signed the commencement order for COCO's law, which is also known as the Harassment, Harmful Communications and Offences Act. While working on COCO's law, I was deeply affected by the stories of many women who were subject to online abuse and harassment. Often, they did not even know who to turn to for help or if what they were experiencing was a crime. This legislation is an essential element in deterring and punishing those who misuse technology to harm others. It will also encourage and support victims to report these crimes, knowing that stronger laws are in place now. I feel privileged to be Minister for Justice, to be in a position where I can introduce changes which will help women at times of great difficulty. But I also feel privileged to be in a position where I can continue the great work of so many women who came before me to improve politics and public life for women. This is a goal that I know we all share. I would like to wish all of the Polish women living in Ireland a very happy International Women's Day. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, back on the floor uh, Professor Galligan. Uh, so, uh, so we've heard from uh, all of our speakers now. Uh, so, uh, so now I'll allow Professor Galligan uh, for a summary of around eight, nine minutes and uh, or less. <laughs> it's, up, it's up to you, Professor Galligan. Uh, and then I'll invite Ambassador Sainske on the floor as well. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, and I will 
do my best uh, to summarize what has been a really uh, amazing morning of wisdom and by amazing women uh, that have spoken today. Uh, so my, what I'm going to try and do is try and organize um, the presentations as I heard them in, in some shape or form and pick out some of the key themes that I thought emerged from it. Uh, I apologize if this is going to be a little bit disjointed, uh, but as uh, participants will understand, I have been doing this as uh, the speakers have been giving their presentations. So much of what I have heard, I have been listening along with you for the first time. So uh, in thinking about uh, what we have heard today, I think we can categorize it in three main areas. So one theme is around leadership. One theme is around highlighting the imbalances in leadership. And the third theme is about creating role models. So <clears throat> I have some picked up some thoughts along the way uh, given by the speakers and, and I will share them with you now. And I was very struck by um, the um, theme that minister, of leadership that Minister Schmidt introduced when she said that empowering women is something that crosses all borders. And uh, the framing of uh, this in that way uh, enables us, is, is very resonant with the um, with, with what we expect of an International Women's Day event, which is that we cross borders in solidarity with one another as women to support one another in all our lives. Um, and that was followed by a phrase that uh, Mayor Hazel Chu said when she said, it is not where we want to be on women's leadership. And this was a very common theme that other speakers picked up on as well. There was also the idea that more women in leadership will bring a broad variety of perspectives to all areas of decision making. And again, as Mayor Hazel Chu said, women's leadership should not be a rare thing. It should be a normal thing. Um, Pulling from uh, the uh, video uh, of uh, Women and Girls for International Girls' Day, it was very clear, coming from that, that young women uh, should be encouraged to be bold, to be confident in their abilities, to work hard, and to use their connections with others. Indeed, a word resonating from uh, this video and also among all the other speeches in one shape or form was the word brave, be brave and be bold. One of the challenges, and then in terms of leadership, there was a lot of reflection on the challenges. Um, and one of the challenges that women face is reconciling work and family life. And it is a common theme that women face this challenge more than men do. This is a theme passionately addressed by Von de Buch, um, who uh, spoke at length about family friendly policies and that these are more likely to happen when organizations and leaders recognize the benefits that result from having family friendly policies. It enables more women to be in leadership positions. This contributes to equality, to fairness, and empowering women more generally, which is an all round positive for society, for uh, political, social, and economic life. And in that regard, speaker Anita Kijana gave us a fascinating insight into the achievements, the failures, 
the strengths and weaknesses in the business world that we can learn many lessons from. Um, one of the many gems of wisdom in that presentation uh, that I quickly picked up on, and there are many, but one of them was um, that success is a matter of who you surround yourself with. These are really true words. Surrounding yourself with the right people is indeed uh, a success. In terms of imbalances, all speakers highlighted the imbalances related to women in leadership in our societies. Uh, it was reiterated time and time again that women continue to occupy significantly fewer management positions or political positions or positions of senior leadership. And the underrepresentation of women leads to a lack of balance in decision making and also leads to the reinforcement of stereotyped representations of women and girls that all of the speakers felt needed to be challenged or called out or, um, or, or in other ways addressed. Speakers directly or indirectly referred to the need to work with those who have power, and that is men, and directly or indirectly spoke about taking the message of equality to men uh, more generally. Indeed, bringing men on the equality journey with us is vital for achieving the goal of gender equality. Um, and one of these areas is, of course, the technological industry. And women, one of the reasons women said they found it difficult to work in this area was the fact that men dominated the field. So enabling women to take space alongside men would enable uh, the technological industry to be more, a more friendly place for women in which to work. Um, the final theme that I want to pull things out from is the area of creating role models and the importance of having role models for encouraging women's ambition was again a common theme across all the speeches. Um, our last speaker, Minister McEntee, reminded us of the role model of Countess Markovitz in the early years of Irish democracy. And that was a wonderful uh, connection between Irish and Polish communities and Irish and Polish women to have made on, uh, on this occasion. A particularly useful piece of advice was provided by Yvonne de Buch. She advised us to be smart about choosing our battles. And she shared the battles she has chosen to fight with us on correcting inequality wherever it occurs and encouraging the reconciliation of work and family life. These thoughts complemented the speech of Minister Schmidt, who pointed to Poland's record of success in supporting family related policies. Um, echoing uh, Minister McEntee, um, we know of many capable female colleagues who did not get the opportunity to progress. And so it is important that role models can show that it can be done and inspire others to pursue those paths. So using one's position to improve women's lives is a common feature of the speeches by all today. And in conclusion, the final message I would like to wrap this uh, um, intervention with is the one given by Minister McEntee, that we look forward to the day when we don't have to count the firsts for women in leadership, that being a woman leader can be done and that it is part of our everyday world. And so, uh, with this small effort of trying to pull together all the themes 
and the fascinating insights that have been shared with us today. I will now hand back over to you, Peter. Professor Galligan, thank you for this fascinating summary. And I think it really complements the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you to all the viewers. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. And thank you for Kaffer, uh, Venture Kaffer Warsaw, uh, who, uh, who support us technically and uh, organized, uh, organized uh, the webinar. Uh, from the technical side. So again, thank you very much. And I, now I open the floor for uh, Ambassador Anasolajska. Thank you, Piotr. Um, thank you, Professor Galligan. Dear Yvonne, if I may, uh, what a perfect summary of our today's uh, discussion. I'm very grateful for that. I believe that what we have uh, achieved today is a very productive event. And uh, for that, I want to thank all of our uh, panelists. Um, thank you for the wide-ranging and indeed inspiring speeches. Um, I am grateful that you took the time uh, this afternoon to address uh, so comprehensively the topic uh, on which uh, you all clearly speak so passionately. Uh, there is so much to reflect on, and I am sure I speak for everybody joining us this afternoon when I say that uh, it was indeed a powerful and passionate uh, uh, tour de force uh, from our panelists. Uh, wrapping up, I, I, would, I would like to say what I think Lord, May Lord Mayor Hazel Chu wanted to, to tell us that uh, women's day should last 365 days a year. Um, we will look very hard, uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will work very hard, uh, we will uh, network uh, all year around to make sure that there are more and more young women pursuing leadership careers uh, in politics and uh, business. I use this opportunity to invite uh, all of our panelists and viewers the Women in Leadership Conference next year. I hope that uh, uh, in not so distant future, all of us uh, uh, can meet in uh, person. Let me also uh, thank uh, so much uh, my colleague uh, Piotr Ziembacz, who was not only coordinator, uh, but also, I think, uh, the godfather of, uh, of this uh, event. He was also initiator of this, uh, of this webinar. Thank you, Piotr, so much. And thank you, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, from, from the embassy for making this uh, web uh, webinar um, uh, happen. And uh, once more, uh, I would like to wish you all the best on the occasion of uh, uh, Women's uh, Day and uh, wish you a delightful and great weekend. Thank you so much.